Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it's our privilege today to host a discussion of the new book by Barry Eichengreen and co-authors, In Defense of Public Debt. Clearly, this is a topic of which the Peterson Institute, our cousins at the Peterson Foundation, our surrounding officials and friends in Washington and throughout the world are very curious about. What are the limits of debt sustainability? What are the benefits and risks of public debt? What can you do to make sure public debt is, goes to good use? Are the risks of public debt overstated or understated? Uh, Barry and his co-authors have written this new book, In Defense of Public Debt, uh, arguing the government's ability to issue debt has played a critical role in addressing national emergencies right up through wars and pandemics, as well as funding essential public goods. In these ways, the capacity to issue debt has been integral to state building and state survival. Public debt securities have contributed to the development of private financial markets, and through this channel to modern economic growth. I think most of us would agree with those characterizations, but Barry, uh, as always, brings a wealth of not just economic insight, but insights from history and political science to this discussion. And we have similarly wise and wide ranging discussions of the book to come. So please let me introduce the speakers and then we'll get right into it. Speaking for us is, first is of course, Barry Eichengreen. He's the George C. Party and Helen N. Party Professor of Economics and Professor of Political Science at the University of California at Berkeley. He's been teaching there since 1987. Um, Barry is also, I'm proud to say, a member of the Board of Directors of the Peterson Institute. More importantly, Barry is of course a prolific and widely read author. He's held Guggenheim and Fulbright Fellowships, been a fellow of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Palo Alto and the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin. From 1997 to 98, he was Senior Policy Advisor to the International Monetary Fund. And from 2004 to last year, he was the convener of the Bellagio Group of Academics and Officials. His most recent book is the one we discussed today, but of course, his other books include Golden Fetters, which was a complete and important rethinking of the international monetary system and his book a year or so ago on populism. Um, Barry will be followed by our colleague and friend Maya McGinnis, who is the president of the Bipartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, she has been leading that organization for a long time. Um, and in the spring of 2009 for Variety, she did a stint in the Washington Post editorial board. Uh, previously, she's overseen a lot of the committee's projects, including the committee's Fiscal Institute, Fix US, a project to better understand the root causes of our nation's growing divisions and deteriorating political system, and a new project in the future of economy, technology, and capitalism. Maya has also previously worked at the Brookings Institution and on Wall Street. Following Maya will be Anna Gelbern, a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute and professor of law and Anne Fleming research professor at Georgetown School of Law. She writes about government debt and financial regulation, co-directs the Sovereign Debt Forum, and has contributed to multilateral non-governmental reports on financial reform and sovereign debt management. Earlier this year, she and co-authors released a groundbreaking study of Chinese debt contracts and the international sphere to sovereign borrowers, uh, which continues to have repercussions to today. My only speaking today is Peter Orzag, who I'm proud to say is also a member of the board of the Peterson Institute. He is the chief executive officer of financial advisory of Lazard, uh, having taken up that position in June, 2019. Prior to that, he was Lazard's head of North American mergers and acquisitions since July 2018 and global co-head of healthcare since November 2016. He came to Lazard from Citigroup, but prior to that served as director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Obama administration from January 20, 2009 to July 2010. And he was director of the Congressional Budget Office from January 2007 to December 2008 in these capacities as a policymaker and in serious writing before and after those policy roles. Peter has been a major influence on fiscal policy. We were delighted to publish his co-authored piece with Robert Rubin and Joseph Stiglitz earlier this year, 
on a new approach to worrying about interest rates and fiscal policy. So we have a variety of views, a plethora of experts, and I am very excited to ask Barry Adam Green to present his new book, In Defense of Public Debt. Barry? Adam, thank you um, for the kind introduction for assembling this amazing panel. Um, it's a, a special pleasure for me to speak uh, uh, under the aegis of an institution uh, with which I've been involved for like 25 years. So we go way back. Um, if you are of my vintage, you will be aware that there has been something of a sea change uh, in views of public debt. Maya will probably remind us that the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget dates from 1981, I believe. Um, uh, marking the fact that there was widespread concern at that time about uh, government overspending and, and, and fears that public debt was on a dangerously unsustainable path, worries that found themselves into the Maastricht Treaty on, on uh, Economic and Monetary Union, into the 1990 U.S. Budget Enforcement Act, for example. Uh, both measures were indicative of widespread worry that government spending and government debt were dangerously out of control. A consensus that wobbled, at least in, in, in the face of the global financial crisis, uh, which occasioned the $787 billion Obama stimulus, which caused uh, federal government debt in the hands of the public uh, to shoot up from 36% of GDP at the beginning of 2008 to 53% of GDP. At the end of 2009, uh, the proportionate and, and absolute increase in debt to GDP ratios were even larger in the cases of European countries, such as Ireland, that had to fix broken banking systems. But once recovery from that crisis was clearly underway, governments uh, turned back toward austerity and, and, and the events of 2008, 2009 could be dismissed as no more than a temporary deviation from fiscal orthodoxy. Then of course came COVID-19. We have seen governments running unprecedented deficits and accumulated debts, debt to GDP ratios that are unprecedented in peacetime. So the US federal deficit the last time I looked was 13% of GDP. Debt in the hands of the public now exceeds 100% of GDP. Similar trends are evident uh, elsewhere, including in, uh, of all places, uh, Germany. Euro area wide, uh, debt is more than 100% of GDP, just as in the United States and far above the 60% reference value. Uh, in, in the Maastricht Treaty and its successors. And something similar is true around the world. So I snatched this figure from the IMF's latest fiscal monitor uh, caution about the vertical axis being different for the three categories of countries, but varying vertical axes notwithstanding, you can see uh, the clear upward trend in the debt to GDP ratio, not so much in the interest expense as a share of GDP, something to which I'll return momentarily. So the two questions uh, prompted by this recent experience is, is this change, apparent change in attitudes and practices justified and will it last, will it persist? Justified, the answer clearly to my mind, and I think most people's, is yes, extraordinary circumstances justify extraordinary action, and the global pandemic has been an extraordinary circumstance. A uh, government that does not respond to this kind of public health and economic emergency by mobilizing all available resources, including resources that can only be mobilized by borrowing, will not long retain its legitimacy. So we hear politicians, if not always economists, reasoning by way of analogy between the household budget and the government budget, uh, just as a responsible household should live within its means under normal circumstances, so too should a responsible government. But 
to repeat, a government that doesn't borrow in order to provide essential services during a deadly pandemic would be accused of dereliction and rightly so, just like parents who refuse to borrow to obtain life-saving surgery for a child. In, in, indeed, we've seen this throughout history. We've seen states and ru rulers borrowing to meet emergencies where the principal emergencies in question have been wars. Rulers have borrowed to uh, expand their domain, but to defend it and survive, borrowing to mount a sturdy national de defense strengthened the state in the material sense, uh, sense of repelling invaders, but also in, in a political sense, because a state that provides a sturdy national defense gains legitimacy in the eyes of, of, of its public. So it follows that Europe was the public debt pioneer because war has been especially prevalent throughout Europe's history. There, there have been so many, literally hundreds of princely kingdoms and territorial states butting up against one another, reflecting Europe's political geography, which in turn reflects Europe's physical geography with uh, mountain ranges and river valleys dividing the continent up in, into small uh, territorial states, unlike, say, China, much of which is a great plain with unified, uh, ruled by unified political dynasties, not subject to uh, war as the normal state of affairs. So my the talk today, if not the, and not the book, the talk anyway is Eurocentric, because public debt history is in fact Eurocentric. From from the start, uh, sovereign borrowing. We talk about public debt and sovereign debt more or less interchangeably. Sovereign borrowing was subject to commitment problems. The king or the sovereign was the supreme earthly power and the embodiment of the state, as Louis XIV famously reminded his subjects. But the sovereign's unlimited power ironically limited his ability to borrow since there was nothing to prevent him from reneging on his debts. So sovereigns could borrow only for short terms and at high interest rates until checks and balances on those sovereign prerogatives were successfully put in place. Sovereign debt began its rise to modern, modern levels and borrowing costs began their fall to modern levels only with the creation of representative assemblies in which the creditors sat, uh, in which those creditors were empowered to oversee tax collection, approve increases in spending and authorize debt issuance. So we saw those representative assemblies develop first in compact city states where you could get the creditors and other representatives together in a room, and then in certain territorial states like the Netherlands and England. And I show you on the right how Dutch uh, sovereign borrowing costs came down over the century and a half during which this political revolution took place and during which sovereign debt came to be recognized as an obligation of the state rather than a, a, of the individual, the mortal individual occupying the throne. There were also economic preconditions for the rise of sovereign debt. So if you've been following the debate, you're well aware of R minus G, of the importance uh, uh, of the difference between the uh, in real interest rate on uh, sovereign debt and the rate of growth of GDP. Uh, at the same time, real interest rates were, were declining rates of economic growth in, in, in Europe and its overseas offshoots were going up as a result of the commercial and industrial revolutions. So I show you at, 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 at the right, the choppy but steady decline in R minus G. Uh, over the century plus leading up to um, World War I. So there is a sense in which modern public finance and modern levels of public debt are corollaries of modern economic growth. Finally, there were financial preconditions for the development of, of modern public debt markets. Um, 
uh, successful issuers had to create secondary markets on which debt securities could be bought and sold. And in general, they had to create an entity, the central bank, to backstop that market, helping to ensure its stability and liquidity, as in the case of the Bank of England, which I show you at the right. All of which had spillovers for private financial markets and for modern economic growth. So as these markets develop and checks and balances on the sovereign are put in place, government debt securities come to be seen as safe and liquid, and they are accepted as collateral for other borrowing and lending. They spur the development of private debt markets. Scholars of what we call the great divergence between the West and the rest ask why was Europe first? Why was it the part of the world first to experience modern economic, financial, and commercial development? So Europe's precocity in issuing public debt isn't the entire story, but I would submit it's an important part of the story. Over time, the, the uses of public debt have evolved. The reasons why governments borrow have evolved. So financing wars, has remained of premier importance. I show you the US case on the right and you can see how US public debt history is punctuated by debt accumulation during wars. But starting in the 19th century, governments also borrowed for developmental purposes to invest in uh, the infrastructure associated with modern economic growth, roads, railways, ports, urban lighting, sewers, and then starting in the, really in the 20th century, governments have also borrowed in order to finance current spending on social programs, transfer payments, and so forth, which borrowing for which purpose stepped up after World War I, again in the Great Depression, most especially in the advanced countries from the 1970s. So I would argue that borrowing to finance infrastructure uh, investment made, made sense. Uh, I, uh, the headline here alludes to the current debate over this question in the United States, but borrowing to finance uh, transfer payments less obviously makes sense. Um, that's something that has to be explained and that we try to at least partially explain in, 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 in the book. Uh, governments borrow to finance current spending on social programs and transfer payments because Demands for those uh, uh, kind of expenditures rise at the same time when revenues fall. Uh, we see that pattern because of political fractionalization in a fractionalized political system. Each political faction uh, has just enough power to defend its preferred social programs, but not enough power to enforce cuts in spending on the preferred programs on others, Mansur Olson's logic of collective action or Ricardo Hausman's common fiscal common pool problem, if you will. And I think this tendency to borrow in order to finance current spending is, is aggravated by political polarization and electoral uncertainty. Policy Politicians push for more spending on their favorite programs when in office, revenue constraints notwithstanding, since they may be in a weaker position to push such spending later when they're out of office. And the, and the more polarized the polity, the more their preferences differ, the more they will push. Then of course came uh, COVID-19. Uh, the public health emergency was a crisis tantamount to war and it elicited a warlike fiscal response. I return to the question of whether this sea change in attitudes and actions will persist. Is the change in the fiscal landscape simply the product of COVID-19 and no more? And once the pandemic is passed, hopefully the pandemic will be passed, this intellectual tide will go back out. Shouldn't we expect the status quo ante, namely old attitudes cautioning against excessive debts to now resurface? Maybe this is what we're already seeing in the US Congress. I would argue that the uh, change in attitudes predates COVID-19. There 
was already much discussion in the economics community about the costs of premature austerity after the global financial crisis. Thomas Piketty had already raised consciousness about inequality. Raghu Rajan had been writing about fault lines. In other words, there was already growing recognition of the need for government to provide public goods, uh, education, healthcare, basic research, transportation infrastructure, climate change abatement that markets don't adequately supply left to their own devices. Um, historians talk about successive orders in American political history, the New Deal order with a more expansive state, the neoliberal order starting in the 1980s with a less expansive state. Are we now swinging back toward a new New Deal order as a result of, uh, of COVID and all of the above? In addition, there's the fact that lower interest rates make heavier debts sustainable. In the United States, federal government debt service costs just uh, 2% of GDP in 2020, unchanged from 2001, when debt in the hands of the public relative to GDP was barely a third what it is now. And interest rates on public debt are lower, not only in the United States, but uh, across the advanced country world and by historical standards in significant parts of, uh, of the developing world as well. The question being whether these low rates will persist. Every, everyone is entitled to their answer, uh, but that answer should depend on, on why everyone thinks rates are low. Are they low because of the high savings of Germany, Saudi Arabia, fast growing emerging markets such as China? Are they uh, Mr. Bernanke's favored in, uh, explanation? Are they low because of the shift from manufacturing to services and from factories to digital platforms, which are less investment intensive? Mr. Summers preferred explanation. Are they low because of growing inequality and high savings rates uh, of the wealthy? We can well imagine that a number of these factors uh, could now begin to reverse. And if they do, governments will be faced with difficult choices. Uh, I remind you here of, of the basic uh, equation we economists use to analyze debt dynamics. The change in the debt to GDP ratio over time, D, is a function of the primary surplus net of interest payments run by the government relative to GDP. Um, it's a function of the inherited debt uh, multiplied basically by the interest rate growth rate differential, and it can be affected by uh, uh, debt management operations and uh, defaults and so forth, all of which go into the so-called stock flow adjustment. So in the book, we use this decomposition to look at a number of successful debt consolidation episodes. And what we learn is that historically, high debts have been brought down mainly by the ability of governments to run primary budget surpluses over long periods of time. So I show you the amazing history of Great Britain after the Napoleonic Wars, when it brought its debt to GDP ratio down from 200% of GDP to 30% of GDP by running primary budget surpluses over an entire century, persistently for 100 plus years or the United States after the Civil War, which basically extinguished its federal government debt by running primary budget surpluses for half a century, except for a couple of years during the Spanish-American War. Uh, we look at experience after World War II, when some people say that uh, public debt consolidation was achieved purely through fast growth and financial repression, not true. Primary budget surpluses were run persistently for a quarter of a century by a wide variety of different countries. Can it be done now? Uh, we live in a different political environment. Uh, uh, more extensive franchise, more polarized political systems. So some time back, Ugo Panitza and I looked at 
looked for countries that were able to run primary budget surpluses as large as 5% of GDP for as long as 10 years. And we found only three very special circumstances. A country which discovered massive amounts of oil and gas in the North Sea and socked it, uh, uh, a lot of the revenues away in its sovereign wealth fund, Norway. A country with the highest debt to GDP ratio in Europe that desperately wanted to qualify for monetary union, Belgium, and it qualified by running primary budget surpluses. And a country with a strong technocratic government in a geopolitically exposed place, Singapore, which has similarly been able to build up its sovereign wealth funds over time. These are, these are not normal countries from a political economy standpoint, in other words. Um, so can it be done now through surprise inflation, on the other hand? So there's some economists like my friend Charles Goodhart who argue that debts will be inflated away as they were, I show you here on the right in Weimar, Germany. I'm skeptical. Investors are going to uh, adjust their maturities. Uh, so the increase in inflation would have to be very big and or there would have to be repeated inflationary surprises. I'm skeptical uh, uh, that that's going to happen because I think the creditors lobby is in countries like the United States is every bit as powerful as the debtors lobby. And I think stability culture is deeply ingrained in today's central banking community. Can it be done through faster economic growth by growing the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio? That's what Europe is hoping for with its recovery fund. Lots of people are hoping for faster productivity growth as a result of the digital revolution and all the things we've learned during the pandemic. There's no evidence of a sustained acceleration of productivity growth yet. And history suggests that it takes time. It can take a decade or two for firms and universities and others to reorganize how they do business to capitalize on new general purpose technologies. So I conclude then uh, from this history that there are no simple solutions to the situation in which we now find ourselves. History shows that countries uh, that have successfully addressed problems of debt sustainability without experiencing major economic, financial, and political dislocations have done so by turning to fiscal restraint, running primary budget surpluses when the time is right, not before, by growing their economies successfully, and by avoiding deflation running modest rates of inflation. And failing to address the problem from all three angles can be a recipe for disaster. So that's where we conclude. Um, I look forward to reactions. Thank you, Barry. Just to remind our audience uh, that our setup is any registered participants may post questions on the Q&A function on Zoom. After the discussants use the Q&A function, not chat, not anything else. After the discussions have spoken, I'll gather questions, as many as we can fit in from the Q&A function. Thank you for that. Uh, turning to our first discussant, Maya McGinnis, please. Thank you so much. Glad to join all of you. Um, this book is really good. And I just have to start by saying, like, if you want to be able to put the debt in historical context, it does absolutely the best job. Um, up until this moment, my favorite book had been Hamilton's Blessing but I think I am updating that um, and really recommend this to, to folks. I'm gonna read it a second time because I learned so much about the history and importantly, the global context. Um, I'll start by saying, I think we probably all agree that there's absolutely a role for debt in the US and global economy. Um, it's important, it's necessary during emergencies and times of economic contraction. Uh, I was actually one of those people, I'm sort of embarrassed to say, who fretted about paying off the debt uh, in the first op that I ever wrote, because if we had government surpluses, that would get rid of this. The treasury market, such a key role, which plays such a key role in the global economy. And obviously, I was not yet familiar enough with the political realities that that is not the greatest concern. Um, but I think also after COVID, uh, we've just lived through the perfect example of when we have to borrow, 
why it's so important to be able to. Um, and I'm guessing the authors, I assume you wrote much of this before COVID and that the authors would probably concede that the need for the book felt much stronger before COVID when we actually uh, were able to have bipartisan support for trillions of borrowing, which I'm not sure it was clear we would have been able to before such an emergency, but it was reassuring uh, that we were able to borrow as necessary. Huge reminder why we need to have such a sound fiscal balance sheet so you can borrow at times like that. Uh, and the, of course, really upsetting, discouraging reality is there will be many more COVIDs, whether they come in the form of pandemics, natural disasters, cyber attacks, and probably many things we haven't even contemplated. So ideally, um, I think the, the rule of thumb still makes sense that you borrow in bad times and you save in good times, or at least you borrow less um, than puts you on a path where your debt is growing faster than your economy. And the concern, of course, for the US is that we are on a path so often now these days where the debt's growing faster than the economy. Um, so I'd say the bulk of our concerns still are not that we're unwilling to borrow, but that we're unwilling to pay for things. And I would add that our budget really focuses too little on investments and long-term planning. So just if you look at some of the fiscal metrics where we are right now, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, we're at 100% of GDP compared to below 40% when we went into the last economic crisis of 2008, 2009. Um, and one would want to be at a place where they were comfortable, we were in good shape when the next economic crisis does come along. Uh, we are on track to borrow $13 trillion over the next decade, even not accounting for the trillions that it looks quite likely could be a part of um, the Build Back Better plan. So that's if we do nothing new, $13 trillion in debt over the next decade already built into the budget. Interest payments, about $300 billion plus per year, they're assumed that they will triple over the next decade. Um, and a number of our major trust funds, which is related to our national debt, they are projected to be insolvent in the coming years, and yet we continue to do nothing about them. So I think the causes to, for concern on the side of overborrowing are many, and they're not just economic problems. It's not just slower growth or lower standards of living than we otherwise would have. And quick note, people I say like, you know, we're doing okay. People have been worrying about the debt, but we're fine. We actually don't know the counterfactual of how we would have been, how the economy would look if we hadn't borrowed so much money for consumption or non-critical emergencies in the past. Um, but I think there's serious concerns for the economic downside of excessive debt, but also the geopolitical threat, which leaves us um, vulnerable to so many things now, including our relationship with China, and it hampers our ability to conduct foreign policy in ways that we might otherwise want to. So I think the threats from being over indebted are definitely growing. Um, so I feel like I spend my career complaining too much about things and I always like to try to offer solutions. This is just going to be super broad principles, but what is it that we should be doing? I think the first thing, given where we are in the economic recovery, and this could change if COVID gets worse, if things turn down, this wouldn't be the case. But right now we should be back in a pay-as-you-go world where we are looking at all sorts of initiatives and those that are important enough to do, we are paying for them. Um, and I would actually, I would address sort of the points that, that you made there about a lot of people have raised a lot of big, new, important issues, income inequality, the need for more public goods. And I agree with those completely. Um, income inequality, in my mind, is, is there's so many big problems we're facing, but absolutely one of the biggest problems that we're facing. But they don't go hand in hand with not paying for the policies to address them. There's a difference between saying something is really important, we shouldn't pay for it and saying something is really important and we should pay for it. And I tend to, when the economy is strong, fall on that second camp. Um, even for a lot of investments, and we could go into more about why, but in most cases, investments that are paid for over a certain amount of time are much better for the economy than those that aren't. Uh, certainly if those pay-fors are smart, and there are lots of examples like um, climate and a carbon tax where the pay-fors actually even help you achieve your policy goals. But so we should go to a world of pay-as-you-go, Putting in place a gradual plan to bring back down our debt and pour up our trust funds doesn't happen to happen quickly, shouldn't happen abruptly, but it should be put in place. Um, shift our budget out of consumption into investment in as many places as possible. And what goes hand in hand with this is reforming our social contract, which is so outdated for the threats or the, the challenges of the past century rather than those of the current. And I would just say things like, lifelong learning, which need to be contemplated as part of a social contract, how to think about shoring up the social contract, what those new needs are, and reining in some of the outdated policies 
And finally, reforming the budget process, because I think every one of us should be kind of outraged that we don't even have a budget or a blueprint in plan for the budget right now. We don't have fiscal metrics. We have government shutdowns. We're about to hear about default again. Like, let's get this budget process fixed and hopefully work into that ways to accommodate their times you should be borrowing and their times you shouldn't. Let me just end by saying, I think it's so important what the authors talk about the role of polarization in trying to deal with fiscal issues because polarized environment where two warring camps, rather than focusing on running their, our country, are more focused on politics over policy and the immediate over the long-term um, consistency uh, no longer, <laughs> consistency doesn't seem to matter, hypocrisy seems to rule these days. Um, unwilling to deal with trade-offs and compromise seems to be a, a something that's much more difficult to come by. Those are all results of the huge levels of polarization we have. And those are the things that need to happen for us to be more reasonable fiscally. Basically using our debt in a way that is motivated by economics rather than politics. I think that would be a great place for us to land as a nation to figure out when it makes sense from an economic perspective, but stop taking seriously these political arguments, which basically boil down to debt is really good for the things I like and not really good for the things that I don't like. So I look forward to our discussion. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much, Maya. Now just moving right to the next discussant, Anna Gelper, please. So thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. It's a wonderful book and I am honored to be part of this early discussion. Um, there is so much in here. It's a wonderfully rich story with uh, the kinds of institutional details that lawyers like me love to sink our teeth in. I am not an economist, so I don't really have a very strong or remotely informed view on too much or too little debt. Um, what I found absolutely fascinating about this book is the story of debt as a social and political institution, at least as we understand it, it you know, when Barry mentioned the Eurocentric perspective, it occurred to me, well, that's right, actually, who knows what functional equivalents there might have been out there, but this is the world we see through our lens. And um, to me, really, the most interesting and important part of the book is the um, painstakingly told story of the institutions that make up the debt ecosystem. So from Rome's you know, centralization and monopoly on coinage to um, the fascinating Dutch moves to um, market instruments to investors reflecting their different preferences to the UK's elaborate chartering moves, creation of stock exchanges in London and Japan, um, the very deliberate uh, and essential creation of secondary markets, negotiability rules, uh, collateral, national banking acts in the United States, central banks, of course, and their lending policies, all the way through to the stuff that I'm sure future historians, or let's hope future historians will forget, like the high quality liquid asset you know, treatment of uh, some sovereign debt and uh, various Basel III uh, rules. So this um, brings me to a um, kind of puzzle that I've been struggling with for a while, and this draws on a paper that's uh, a sh short essay that Ugo Panitza and I are um, uh, coming out with, and that is economists in particular tend to frame sovereign borrowers as kind of defective corporates, right? So they're kind of like corporate debtors, except they can't commit, right? And therein lies the problem. So from that perspective, um, the key attribute of sovereignty is immunity from contract enforcement. And that is surely right. But it also makes us forget that um, these commitment challenge debtors also charter their creditors. They charter the stock exchanges, the corporations, the banks, the investment funds, they regulate them. They make the rules for the market in which the debt trades. So this other attribute of sovereignty, authority to make and enforce the rules, and then to negotiate market access terms with other sovereigns, again, HQLA comes to mind, um, 
is something that seems to just make episodic appearances in the literature. And I think this is where this book actually has so much more to add to what's out there already. There is, of course, the crude financial repression version, right? The um, sort of bad king that stuffs, um, you know, his banks chock full of his debt and then chops off the bankers' heads. Um, but financial repression is just one extreme, right, of a very broad and complex governance spectrum. Um, markets are not naturally occurring phenomena and um, creditors, um, you know, are not um, purely free and all powerful, just like, you know, cotton doesn't grow itself. So um, to me, the interesting question here, again, is the um, looking at how sovereigns project authority and negotiate authority among themselves um, so that, you know, you can do what the United States did, let's say in the 14th Amendment, and in one sentence say the validity of our public debt shall not be questioned, and in the very next sentence repudiate Confederate debt and live to tell the tale and become the world's premier um, safe asset. Um, so this opportunity, I think, to move beyond the contract design frame, the it kind of the all-encompassing focus on immunity, on creditor coordination, is particularly important now. I mean, yes, of course, contract design is interesting and important. Frankly, I was much, I, I, I found the, um, you know, the consoles as a means of getting around the usury prohibition to be a, a far more interesting move in some ways than all the talk on uh, collective action clauses we've been having for 20 years. All right, so this broader set of questions about market design, about safety valves and safety nets, right, is particularly critical now in a world where the boundaries between, you know, public and private are fuzzy. You know, witness the discussion of, about the China Development Bank. Is it public? Is it private? Who cares? Domestic and external, where I think the book is especially strong. Um, liquidity and solvency, the perennial fuzzy boundary. Um, so this is an interdisciplinary project, a historical political science project, um, one that, um, as Maya said, really requires us to revisit um, the particulars of the social contract. And I think it couldn't be more timely. And I'm just delighted that um, here we are and this book is here. So thank you. Thank you, Anna. Finally, let me turn to Peter Orzak. Uh, thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you for having me. I will try to be brief uh, as the final speaker, make five points before I do that, just very quickly on the book itself, because I wanted to, to share in the applause um, a fantastic uh, tour de force on the history of how public debt markets, sovereign debt markets developed. Um, my, my one quibble would be, I think it's very challenging to fit into one book, it, an elaborate discussion going back uh, centuries of the development of public debt with a nuanced uh, discussion of the debates that are happening in real time today. And the book does a little bit of both, um, but it's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic treatise, especially on the history that is uh, difficult to get anywhere else. Okay, five quick points. First, um, I think discussions like this about our current debate uh, are missing one big thing, which is the size of the shift in the fiscal impulse that is occurring as we speak. So if you, uh, if you, talk, if you look, for example, at the Hutchins Center um, fiscal impulse metric, that is how much is fiscal policy in the US adding or subtracting to economic growth? In 2020, depending on the quarter, it was between five and 15% positive. Um, we're already in a zone where it is projected to swing to the negative two to five percentage points. Um, it's not surprising when you add a lot of stimulus to or support to the economy, and then that gets withdrawn that that flips quickly. But quoting um, backward looking uh, metrics of the size of the fiscal expansion without noting what's uh, happening going forward, I think, can give a misleading impression of exactly where we are. And I'm happy to talk more about that. 
Second, um, with regard to what we should do going forward, there is one risk that dominates every other risk well beyond the risk of fiscal uh, a fiscal uh, implosion or uh, negative debt dynamic, and that involves the climate. We are uh, at a critical moment over the next 10 to 15 years on the carbon transition. Anything that we can do, whether it's R&D or uh, additional government investment to help spur the transition uh, away from fossil fuels is absolutely worth borrowing for, even if it's not, uh, you know, even if there's not a financing source other than government debt by, I think, a wide margin when you look at the relative risks involved. So I put one category above all others, uh, including um, traditional infrastructure, given the risks that we face today. Third, I wanted to highlight, uh, Adam mentioned uh, the paper that I did with Bob Rubin and Joe Stiglitz um, for the Peterson Institute uh, earlier this year. I think there are two or three key points there that are relevant here. One, um, very importantly, is the observation that there is no clear threshold that one can identify. That is a, you know, don't go here zone for fiscal policy. And the attempts that have been made to impose one come off increasingly as quite artificial, the Maastricht Treaty limits of uh, 3% and 60% as a particularly salient example, the 3% was made up by uh, two French um, uh, finance ministry bureaucrats with no real logic behind it other than 3% seems good. And the problem with any arbitrary metric uh, is that it's very arbitrary in this undermines its credibility. And so unfortunately we are stuck, I know everyone wants an anchor or a target, but we are stuck with the reality that we don't know. And we can talk through what the consequences of that may be. Uh, fourth, and despite what has been said uh, before about polarization, there is a pathway forward for those who are concerned about fiscal rectitude over the long term. And it involves the fact that the Social Security normal retirement age is increasing as we speak. This is a fact that no one seems to talk about, but things that are put in place far in advance and that take effect gradually survive even highly polarized uh, environments. Um, and again, the fact that the normal retirement age is increasing up until up through next year get zero public attention, zero political attention, zero legislative attention, even in today's highly polarized environment. And it opens up a pathway for those, and this is something that Bob Rubin and Joe Stiglitz and I also spoke about, that if you're worried about uh, the fiscal future, you can put some um, buffer zones in, tilt many of our uh, longer term entitlement programs towards fiscal balance, with the acknowledgement that if the world turns out differently in the future, that could be undone. But the key to doing that is to make the future adjustments gradual and small enough each year that it's frankly not worth anyone's while to undo them. When you create big fiscal cliffs uh, with things that are expiring that are very dramatic, that is when the future uh, Congress or the future political system does tend to act. Final point, um, I think uh, the past history of Chicken Little around the debt limit in the United States has led to a remarkable degree of complacency uh, in financial markets and in most of the media about the next month or month and a half here in the United States. I personally do not see any pathway currently to an increase in the debt limit actually occurring. Um, because it requires, uh, at least under the pathways that have been put forward, 10 Republican votes. And I have a hard time seeing how those 10 Republican votes materialize. So I think we are unfortunately perhaps over-indexing on the experience of the past, which is that we always somehow find a solution. We will find a solution here. The debt limit will be increased. But the relevant question is, will it be increased with some kind of smooth landing? or it will be increased only after a TARP-like experience where there's a panic that causes 
a subsequent increase to um, become necessary. I would, I find it hard to believe we're just going to kind of sing kumbaya, come together, hold hands, and raise the debt limit without some significant turbulence in the meanwhile. Back to you, Adam. Thank you, Peter. Um, before turning back to Barry and Casey as a response, building on something Peter just said, I want to bring in a question from Sharmin Mosabar Romani to Barry and to Maya. So P Charmin asks, where are the red lines for fiscal discipline in terms of debt to GDP in the US and in terms of the level of taxation of corporations and individuals? Peter's point three, at least in part, was that talking in terms of numerical red lines is, is not feasible or not useful, um, if I'm oversimplifying slightly. Um, so Barry and Maya, I was wondering before we go to more general discussion, what are your thoughts on numerical limits and red lines, both on tax levels and debt levels? Yeah, well, certainly on debt levels, I think there's no question that there is no red line. Um, unfortunately, rather than there being some clear level which we could you know, move up towards but not get past because we knew in advance, which would also be more of an action, action forcing issue, um, there is not. It is actually like climate. Um, in that it is something that slowly becomes worse and worse, but there's no one moment when you know you've hit a tipping point, um, unless you do, unless something big happens, but you don't know it in advance. Um, but this is probably going to be the wrong example, but I think more than red lines, it is more like that definition of pornography, which is you'll know it when you see it. We'll, we'll know when we're in a problem when it hits us. Um, and it's not something we're going to know in advance, but in many ways it's going to be when other when the lenders lose confidence and where the U.S., uh, either for economic reasons or for political reasons. And since I worry that the debt situation right now is more like a bubble, that it's based on things that aren't sustainable, that as soon as you see small changes or small losses in faith and confidence, that the U.S. is a place where you should lend and rates, rates are stable and po the politics are stable, if you see small cracks in that, that it will change very abruptly. So it will be so much easier. And I agree with Peter, like, any metric that you make, you put in, you've made up. But I still think if you don't have metrics or kind of processes that push the politicians in the other direction from the free lunch mentality of don't pay for anything, you run into more problems on that side. But there's no magic. There's no certain line at all. Thanks, Maya. Barry, what are your thoughts on these issues? I, I very much agree. Um, I think I've been, been criticizing in print the, uh, the Maastricht rules, 60% debt to GDP ratio since 1998. Um, that was put in place in a period when uh, real interest rates in Europe were a large multiple of what they are now. So whatever uh, uh, arithmetic went into them then uh, no longer uh, uh, applies. I think we should uh, applaud the fact that the IMF does debt sustainability analyses for its members, but we shouldn't believe the results. Um, what the fund now does that's valuable is it provides basically fan charts when it does those debt sustainability analyses, reminding us that there are a, a, a wide variety of possible outcomes depending on the evolution of the things that go into debt dynamics. So that's a, a, a useful consciousness raising exercise that we shouldn't take literally. I think there are um, things that we can do to uh, put debt on a, on, a, on a sustainable path, enhance the transparency of the fiscal policy making process, delegate, it, delegate more responsibility uh, uh, for the formulation of fiscal policy to independent entities uh, at least the analysis, as in the case of the CBO, but uh, other countries do do even more in that uh, direction. Uh, Adam, do you want me to respond to the others? Um, I, I, I was I, muted. Yes, please, Barry. Very, very quickly, uh, uh, I heard little that I uh, disagree with. I agree with Peter also on 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 the importance of, of thinking about the fiscal requirements of, of climate change abatement as a long-term investment with uh, a large positive payoff, payoff, payoff if it's done sensibly. Uh, I, I think it would be foolish to limit climate change abatement measures to those that can be financed out of current revenues, given the situation that we're currently in. 
um, Anna's raised some thought provoking points about the importance uh, of contracts versus politics in solving the commitment problems that uh, um, governments face when they borrow. This is a, 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 a as you said, Anna, a longstanding problem. And we talk about the, the history of your current concern with collective action clauses in the book. They go back 200 years, almost, uh, those kind of provisions. There, there's uh, a little bit of a disagreement among the co-authors about the relative importance of contracts versus politics in solving these commitment problems. And if you read between the lines of the book, you will, you will see that. Finally, uh, Maya, uh, I, I agree that we need to worry about the next shock, the next pandemic, the next emergencies when we think about managing our public debt. And while you were talking about that, I was reminded of the two last sentences uh, in the book, which read, enduring states are those that cultivate and where necessary restore their capacity to use debt finance and that have the foresight to do so in advance of when it's needed, they will need to do some restoring now. I almost meant to quote that, to read that out in my comments because it's so good, such a good end. Okay, hey, thank you. We have limited time left, so I'm gonna gather a couple of questions. Just to tell our audience for future reference, if you put things on the chat, I'm not gonna read them. You have to put them on the Q&A. Thank you. Um, on the Q&A, our former colleague, German Zettelmeyer writes, Barry, referring to your last slide, does managing down the debt but not too early require some sort of fiscal framework or fiscal rule, or can this be achieved solely through discretionary policy? The things you just said relate to that, but I'd like to get a sort of more pointed answer on that. And then a, a second question that I'll say to the group from Christopher Herzag. Um, do you see political will to support medium-term fiscal consolidation following recoveries from recession? And, and this goes to, I think, everybody. I mean, we can all talk about that there's multiple ways to do it, and Barry gave specific examples like Belgium and Singapore at certain points. But what, what does achieve political will, or does it exist to, to get consolidation, short of an IMF program, of course? So Barry, first on the fiscal rule question from Zettelmeyer, and then more generally on the question of political will from Mayor Singh. So for Chairman, um... You ask about fiscal rules and fiscal frameworks. Those are not exactly the same thing. So you can put in place a framework for thinking about uh, debt management and debt consolidation without going as far as, as the European Union has done, putting in place a rule where you have to eliminate 2% of the, the difference between your current debt and the target of 60% each year. Seems to me uh, a framework for thinking about what is uh, sustainable debt given real interest rates and real growth rates and initial conditions makes a lot of sense, but, but a hard and fa fa a rigid rule, arbitrary rule, as Peter put it rightly, uh, I, I, I don't think makes sense in, in, in that context. And of course, uh, the, uh, what we're gonna have to do, how this will all play out, will critically depend on, on whether interest rates stay low or not and when they begin to rise as you put at the end of your question, Chairman. Um, at the, um, on, 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 I guess it was Chris's question about what is, um, do we have the political will to do the necessary? It depends on what country you're talking about. I infer you're asking about the United States. And, uh, uh, again, I think uh, what Peter described in terms of the debt ceiling debate probably applies more broadly. Uh, do we have to run into the wall before there is the kind of um, uh, broad-based political will to do the necessary, or can we begin to move in that direction uh, in advance? One can hope. Anna, Maya, Peter, any comments from any of you on this issue of when there's will to do what's necessary? Sure, I'll answer the political will, will question and the answer is no, 
There is no political will to do the right thing, to pay for things, to cooperate, to compromise. That's back to this really important point of the more polarized we are, the harder an issue like this is. Um, there is political compromise on things that are easy, meaning usually borrowing, very little on dealing with things that are difficult. Two quick points. One would have hoped that external threats, and, and I would count a pandemic as a threat, would further unify us rather than divide us. The fact that we failed that test, test makes me worry about that even more because there will be external threats that should unite getting this under control if vulnerabilities start to show. But I think we, we tend to see every difficult moment as a chance to disagree on how to resolve those in this current political and polarized environment. The final thing is what I'd ideally like to do is have a lot of emergency uh, stimulus measures ready to go out the door, but also have tied with them long-term offsets. And Peter made a lot of important points. One of them is policies that are put in place that are more difficult and phase in slowly and start in the future are much easier to pass. So you could have things that along with a stimulus package of a trillion today would phase in big, grad, uh, smaller gradual changes over time that phase in only once whatever your emergency is over. I don't think we have the political will to do that either, but I really liked Barry's point that uh, as frustrating as it is, I think we have to automate some of these hard choices either by outsourcing them or using um, you know, kind of automatic triggers for things that go into place because politicians are unlikely to make any difficult decisions these days. Thanks, Anna or Peter, anything you'd care to say? So my reaction is, and it's very much informed by the book, is that um, governments tend to be far better um, at solving these problems by creating new creditors and uh, new uh, debt contracts out of thin air than by reducing um, the debt. And that uh, even over the long term, I think that the um, uh, commitment challenge in some ways is more, it becomes more interesting if perhaps uh, attenuated. So um, I think it's the belief in the availability of liquidity and the continued capacity of some governments at least to engineer our way out of be it a debt limit or um uh a uh, uh you know what looks like an oncoming crisis that uh that seems to be far more likely um now if we use the use the time well um then it becomes uh, an optimistic um, story. But I don't, I just don't know. But I'm not an economist, so I don't have to. You are not an economist, you probably know better. But um, Peter, even despite your formerly being an economist. I will just end, uh, not directly by answering that question, but with a, a note of optimism. Um, I think we're, we're going to see uh, a period of incredible dynamism for the U.S. economy coming out of the pandemic and as the carbon shift occurs. Um, we're already seeing some early signs of that, that the pandemic is causing um, business models to be shaken up and new businesses to start and um, a lot of innovation. So I take Barry's point that we don't have, I think he said sustained proof yet of higher productivity. I agree with that. Um, but I am hopeful that such proof will emerge as uh, we are dealing with two big things, the post pandemic uh, shifts in the economy and a massive move towards new sources of energy. And I think that will feed back onto the fiscal debate. Terrific. Thank you, Peter, for giving us some grounds for hope. Thank you all, Anna, Maya, Peter, for contributing to this discussion, your individual points of view and your endorsement for Barry's new book. And especially thank you to Professor Barry Eichengreen of the University of California, Berkeley, for presenting his new book, In Defense of Public Debt. We look forward to welcoming you all back to the Peterson Institute on a new next occasion, I hope soon. This meeting is adjourned.